whatever I was doing, no matter how successful I was being, I've always had this voice in the back of my head that has always been telling me that you have to be sharing your story and helping others that are going through a trauma, life challenge, or anything of the sort, um, and helping them get through to the other side and thrive with the rest of their life. Welcome to the Cashflow Chronicles. I'm your host, Johnny Katani, and the founder of Katani Capital Group. For the last two years, I've been studying alternative assets and now help solve the problem of creating passive cash flow for creators, influencers, and busy professionals by bringing you five episodes a week of easy to understand education in the world of passive investing. What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Chronicles. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and I am joined today by Nick Prefontaine. Nick is a three time best selling author and was named a top motivational speaker of 2022 in Yahoo Finance. He's a speaker, founder, and CEO of Common Goal and Buyer's Coach and partner at Smart Real Estate Coach. 2003, Nick was in a snowboarding accident that left him in a coma for over three weeks. The doctor told his parents that he probably wouldn't walk, talk, or eat on his own again. Less than three months later, he was running out of Franciscan Children's Hospital. Now a certified infinite possibilities trainer, Nick speaks to groups to benefit from his message of overcoming adversity. Nick, welcome to the show. Jonathan, that was a mouthful. I'm um, I'm excited to be here. We had to set you up properly, put you up on a nice high tea, so uh, everybody knows exactly what kind of uh, gold they're about to get. So we're very, very excited to have you. Of course, you know, again, incredible resume. Let's let's start at the beginning. I mean, I think everyone wants to know about the snowboarding accident. So let's just start right there and uh, and uh, let you take it away see where it leads, right? That's right. Yeah. So I was um, happy to be here, Jonathan. And um, I was, uh, whenever anyone asked me what my, you know, where did I start? What my origin story is, um, another term for it. I actually go back to that faithful day in 2003, February 5th, 2003. I was at ski club with my friends and I had usually brought my helmet to uh, that mountain when I went to ski club, cause it was a little bigger than what I was used to. However, I just forgot it that day as I was getting ready on the bus, I realized that. And I just thought I'd be careful. I'd be safe. Nothing ever happened. I'd be okay. Um, got to the mountain, headed straight for the chairlift. And then on the ride up, my friends and I noticed that it was very icy because it had been raining. So people were wiping out everywhere. However, it wasn't our, my friends and I, it wasn't our first go around on a snowboard. So I got to the top, buckled into my snowboard, took a breath of that crisp winter air, and then confidently charged towards the biggest jump in the train park with all my speed. And then going up to the jump, I caught the edge of my snowboard on the snow going up the jump, and that kind of threw me off balance. Um, that was the last thing that I remember. So I was told that I landed on my head and I wasn't wearing a helmet. Uh, the doctors, they told my parents that I probably wouldn't walk, talk, or eat on my own again, as you covered in your intro a little bit. Um, this, wasn't, this was an important point, though. Uh, when I was at first, when I was in the ICU at uh, UMass in Worcester, they came in, the doctors would come into my room and... They wanted to share updates on what was happening with me and the more the more grim and grim news um, at the beginning, as I'm sure you can um, you can understand. And my parents made a very pointed decision that they didn't allow the doctors. They stopped them when they came into my room, even though I was in a coma. They knew I was still taking information. So they made them step outside to share the news. And at the beginning, it wasn't it wasn't good. And it, it get, just kept getting worse and worse, it seemed like. And once out of the room, they told my parents that I probably wouldn't walk, talk or eat again. Uh, if you fast forward, if you fast forward four weeks, it was three weeks I was in the coma, but it was a partially induced coma because the impact was so severe. They had to drill a, a shunt into my brain to relieve the pressure. Mm. And without it, the pressure could have gone up and I would have died. After, after a month though, uh, I was, when, once I stabilized, I was transported to a rehab hospital. 
um, in Boston. And that's where I began my journey to walk, talk, and eat again. Now, unknowingly, uh, Jonathan, I used a system to recover from my snowboarding accident. The STEP system is STEP is an acronym, support, trust, energy, and persistence. And I didn't even, I didn't even know about that until a little while ago. Um, fast forward, uh, after being at the rehab hospital in Boston, 60 days, um, I ran out of the hospital. So as soon as I could communicate my, my goal, my parents' goal was for me to make a full recovery. What, what parent wouldn't want that for their child? Absolutely. I, however, I, I had a goal. And I heard a voice in the back of my head that said, no, you're going to run out. So then that became our goal, our common goal. And um, it's, imp it's important that, that I listened to that. Then after running out of the hospital, it wasn't like my work was done. I had to continue to go to outpatient therapy for another six months, wow. along with being tutored all summer long in order to continue on to high school with the rest of my classmates. And looking back on it, it's a little surreal that only 18 months later, I was knocking on the doors of some distressed sellers that hadn't paid their mortgage in months, sometimes years. I don't know if you can relate to this, but when you're younger, and especially when you go through trauma when you're younger, time is really compressed. So I looked at that 18 months and it was a lifetime to me. Yeah, it was like, oh, I, yeah. So it was no big deal. But looking back and I'm like, hmm, that really wasn't a lot of time at all. Um, and so I was knocking on the doors of uh, notice to default people, people that have received the notice of default and trying to set up appointments for our investor to come meet with them uh, the following week to talk with them, discuss about possibly buying their home. Um so looking back on this, and I only reflected on this more recently, I realized that it was a part of my recovery. Uh, so going door to door and helping people out of their unfortunate situation. I did that throughout the rest of high school. And then after I got out of high school, I became a realtor. I got my realtor license and uh, drum roll, please. <laughs> March of 2008. <laughs> really good time. That's Nailed the timing. Every everyone's reaction whenever I say that they they always laugh. They was like, "Ooh, that." But the thing was, um, Jonathan, I didn't know any better. Right. So I heard of all the other agents and all the all the people that I was working with bitching and excuse me, uh, complaining. Okay. <laughs> yeah, complaining that oh that the market's not what it used to be and it used to be so easy. I didn't know any better. So. I was able to be successful as a realtor, even in that environment. Uh, if you fast forward a little bit to 2014, my dad was starting to play with the idea of uh, buying houses non-conventionally on terms without using cash or any of his credits. So without signing personally, he had in the second half of 2014 acquired like 13 or 16 properties just and that was his start and then as he was getting these homes he was like oh shoot i kind of need help marketing these and selling them so to buyers rent home buyers and that's kind of where i entered the picture so when i first when he first asked me i'm glad that he's a good he's a good salesman he asked me more than once i was like no, no, no. I'm going to do my own thing and I'm I'm being a realtor and I'm making my income and everything like that. But he asked me more than once. Um, and then I really fine tuned and perfected the buyer process. That's the process that we have to put our rent home buyers through at the beginning before we accept them of our rent home deals. And throughout the process, when they're in the home, um, ensuring that when they do get to the end, they're going to be able to qualify and get their own loan. So now I now I work hand in hand with our associates all over the country to help them um, work with buyers and bring them through the same process that we've done for years and um, allow them to build a successful, sustainable business. That's awesome. I love it. 
Uh, you've, you've been through a lot, a lot to unpack there. So obviously, you know, to kind of recap, got through the accident, only 18 months later, you made the note that, you know, back then it feels like an attorney now looking back. Um, it's funny you mentioned that because I was having that conversation just a couple of days ago with a friend about how time when you're older, just, I mean, a year is like nothing, uh, you know, at this age. So that's incredible. Right. And, um, you know, that's such a great foundation, right? To show that, you know, people can really overcome anything. And so um, we'll, we'll fast forward now. Now you specialize uh, in these kind of rent to own. So now kind of explain kind of, you know, high level, what exactly that, that process looks like and, and how you got involved with that. Sure. So I touched on it a little bit, but um, however, we're acquiring properties. So we buy them a number of different ways, whether it's through a lease purchase, um, subject to someone's existing loan, and we'll we'll actually close on it. Or um, if someone doesn't have a mortgage and they have no debt on the property, we can structure uh, principal only payments and we'll buy it through owner financing. Those are just that that's like a small snippet of the ways that we can acquire properties and buy properties. Then once we get that equitable interest, and I've it's important to mention that I let my real estate license go in January of 2016. It just didn't make sense for me to keep it anymore mm -hmm. because we are doing so well on the investor end of things. Uh, so you don't need your real estate license to do that. I wanted to uh, do this and do what we do. Um, so once you acquire the home, uh, once you have that equitable interest, you can go out to the market to uh, locate a rent-to-own buyer. We found that there are a lot of people out there. Now, there's only roughly 18% of the market who can get a loan today, walk into a bank and get a loan. So that other 80 or 82%, I'm not saying they're they're all good, Jonathan. However, there's a there's a swath in there. There's a percentage in there that they make good money. Um, they have money saved for the down payment. They just, for one reason or the other, can't get a loan today. So we specialize in working with them, um, getting them into our homes. And as I mentioned, however we're acquiring, we're always selling in a rent to own. So that requires a three to 10% uh, down payment of the purchase price. And um, sometimes it's even more. Than 10%, but it's never less than 3% initially. And then even if it's on the lower end, we work a plan with them to get it up over the course of their term so that by the end, uh, the lender looks at them and says, geez, you've been you put a down payment on the home, you've been living, maintaining it just like it was your own, and you put these additional payments over the course of release. Why wouldn't I give you a loan? We just want to make it a no-brainer as um, a close to a no-brainer as possible. What we found is actually in developing this buyer process, we found that our process and our requirements of what we put buyers through are even stricter than lenders. Wow. And that that's why we're seeing success with it and having a lot of our rental and buyers being able to qualify and get their own loan. So it's really, we'd be okay as investors if they didn't purchase home and then we had to pivot and sell conventionally on the open market. However, um, it's it's like an altruistic, I guess is the word, feeling when you're able to help a buyer and really um, work with a buyer who just has had a life event or something go wrong in their life, get them back on track and get them in the home. And once they close in the home, then we we do well as the investor for bringing both the buyer and the seller together. Uh, the buyer the buyer's awesome. They're walking into equity in most cases, sixty to eighty thousand dollars when they close a deal on average. Wow! And then our seller's making out because their name's off title. Uh, right. They're a hundred. They're a hundred percent done with it. So, I love this process. This is incredible. Obviously, like you mentioned, kind of that altruistic. So, what kind of started at the beginning? What? Uh, where? How do you find the house? Are these always pre foreclosure or distressed or? You know, is it, you know, mailers and, and making lists of, of owners? How are you typically uh, finding the house from the beginning? 
Yeah, generally speaking, this doesn't have to do with the the uh, pre foreclosure. I was I was just kind of given that that's like my background uh, growing up, and that was life experience. I mean, going and going to going to areas of cities, not so good areas, and knocking on doors and talking to people that have missed mortgage payments. I mean, I can't think of any better training um, to be in sales or to be in real estate. So that that's not, I just kind of share that as my background and my experience, but that we don't really have any relation to that now. Got it. Um, more generally, now there's a number of different reasons that we'll buy properties. However, generally speaking, for an example's sake, I can say that usually the homes that we end up buying are uh, homes that for one reason or the other couldn't sell on the open market, like mm. couldn't locate, the seller couldn't locate a buyer to pay them all cash and their listing price 100% of the time. So typically we'll walk into situations like this and say, okay, we'll give you your number or a little bit higher than what the market will bear right now. However, it's going to come in the form of a delayed cash sale. So you're not necessarily getting all the cash right now. However, in three, four, five years, um, we're going to give you that price. And in the interim, we're going to take over all responsibility for maintenance, repair, and upkeep over the course of the term. Then once we get that right, we're passing on the responsibility for maintenance, repair, and upkeep to our rent-to-own buyers. Got so it. they understand that they're not going to call us if the toilet gets clogged, in other words. So it's like, okay, right. Interesting. Okay. Very fascinating uh, space there. So now what do the terms typically look like to turn around and give to your rent-to-buy? They're always the same. Um, so this this is simple. It's It's not necessarily a cookie-cutter um, approach, but by having this, these requirements and this system that we'll bring buyers to, we find that buyers are coming to the end of their leases and being able to get their own loans. We've had, we've even had buyers, I mean, the majority of the time, um, 90, 95% of the time, they're able to get qualified for their loan inside of 24 months. Uh, however, we've even had buyers qualify for a loan after a year or 16 months or 18 months because they've been, um, I get the word that, that's coming to mind is militant, but I, I don't know if that's that's correct here. Um, they've been just disciplined in their approach and followed through on everything that we laid out in the beginning. So we'll lay out a bunch of things and have them initial and sign and all of our deals are done uh, with an attorney. Um, that's going over and meeting with the buyer and signing all all this. And we treat it like a, a traditional, we call it a closing, but it's really nothing more than a form of lease signing uh, where they're putting down their down payment um, and signing a long form lease. Uh, whereas when we meet with them, it's just a, a, a simple LOI. Right. Okay. That makes sense. And so what are the typical terms? Like uh, it sounds like somewhere in the five-year range. Um, for the long-term lease? Yeah, so we'll always, uh, yeah, this is interesting. So we'll always make sure we give ourselves plenty of time. So it can be three years, four years, or five years on the buy-in, like from the seller when we're buying it. Mm. However, we, we always, and 90, 95% of the time, want to make sure that our buyer is able to get done within 24 months and even like a big deal is that we're extending it to 30 months or 36 months. Got it. Um, and that only happens like five or 10% of the time. But then that way, if something happens, God forbid, and they have a, uh, a death, a divorce, a separation, uh, job loss, or something catastrophic in their life that none of us um, could foresee, we'll have enough time to uh, take possession of the property back, um, make sure we get it cleaned out and and everything like that, and bring it up to make make sure it's marketable, and then sell it again to another rental home buyer. Uh, and we'll make sure we have plenty of time on the back end. That's why we want to make sure that we're buying always shorter than we're selling. Right. Okay. Or wait a minute. 
we're buying. So we buy. I, I yeah. confuse that. Yeah, you get it though. Uh, so we have like five years where we're only selling to a buyer with two or three years max. Okay, interesting. And then do these go on their like credit history or what makes it so appealing to lenders that they're willing to accept it outside of like, you know, the typical lending underwriting, you know, where they're kind of looking at your debt to income and, and, you know, harp on your credit score and all of those things. Like, does this go on the credit report? Does it boost all of that? Or, or is it your lender that you have a relationship with? So they, they know that you're going to bring them good borrowers. What does that kind of look like for them? Sure, couple of a uh, couple of interesting points. It's still subject to the one and eight. The lender has to make sure their debt to income ratio lines up, and their their back end, which is when they get a loan, lines up and everything. But we usually have all that, um, and we get all that before we make a decision. So, in order to decide on most properties, we're meeting with anywhere from two to three buyers, sometimes more. And we're bringing them through the whole process, which means that they're going to go to the property. We'll set them up to go in there and view the home. Then if they're interested, they'll get a, an application back to me um, or us. And um, then once I receive them, I'm calling them to review. If we get to a place where we're both comfortable, then we're going to schedule a buyer's meeting. Typically, we're meeting, as I said, with two to three, uh, sometimes more, and more is better buyers and we're going to have two to three packages, buyer packages of letter of intention and all the documents signed that we're going to be able to choose from with regards to who we're going to accept. Then once we accept them, uh, they're signing with our attorney and coming up with the rest of their down payment. And that has to be, as I said, anywhere from three to 10%. Um, and then uh, they're signing and funding with the attorney, and then they're starting their deal. Now, over the course of their deal, one of the things they're signing off on, they're responsible for all maintenance, repair, and upkeep. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, something that's coming to mind, though, that I breezed over, the debt-to-income ratio. So we always want to make sure that uh, their debt-to-income ratio is 30 better than 33%. So 33% are better, meaning that um, the metric that we're always using is taking three times whatever the monthly payment is and making sure their income is in excess of three times a monthly payment. Um, and that's kind of a no brain, like that's a, that has to be in place in order to even talk about down payment. So because of that reason, we're finding that we have more and more qualified buyers that are coming forward and stepping forward and being able to buy our homes. Um, a lot of our buyers are self-employed. They're business owners, moved to a new area, just, just starting a new W-2 position. So they needed a couple of years to qualify. Interesting. And are these all uh, owner-occupied? Like the, the buy to own, they're actually going to occupy or are they sometimes investors who are then going to even you know, bring in another lease to uh, to a tenant or something like that? Yeah, so uh, important point. Whenever investors call me, I'll tell them that, look, this isn't, our program isn't for investors to come in and, and kind of hedge us and then get a buyer at a higher price. That, that's not really what our, our market is and who we're looking to target. We're looking for owner occupants who for one reason or the other can't get along today. And then we're getting them connected with credit enhancement, getting them on the path to home ownership. Um, alternatively, we have had people that are just because of the state of the market, we've had people that are mortgage ready and they're able to qualify for a loan today. They just, they don't want to. So we've had those people go through our program and then there's no prepayment penalty. That's another important point to mention. There's no prepayment penalty. So once the buyer's in the house, they can get a loan whenever they want. Um, we just want to make sure that they understand that take your time, make um, repairs, upgrades, improvements to the home. And uh, then when you're established down payment wise and everything, you can go ahead and get your own loan. Um, Another point to mention is that any improvements and upgrades to the property and subsequent increase in equity that occurs because of those, that's their benefit. That's not our benefit. 
So that's why we're seeing buyers of ours walk into equity uh, with like on average 60 to 80,000. Wow. That's incredible. And are you in every market? Can you be in every market? What markets do you typically focus on? And, you know, how does that process work for you guys? Sure. So we have uh, associates all over the country. um, And we we're always of the um, of the position of an abundance mindset. So even if we have three associates in in a in a particular metro area in a particular area because we usually go anywhere within like two hours driving range um because that's what we've always done so that's what we tell our associates they should do there's more than enough deals to go around so we have an abundance mindset prosperity mindset and uh we're not we're not like black and oh you're you have two associates here i can't be here like there's more than enough business there's more than enough deals to go around that's awesome I love it. Well, one thing that I'm fascinated with um, is you are in a family business and I have a a business in in my family as well. I do not work for it. Um, Unfortunately, it did not work for my family. So I'm very curious and, you know, getting your take on working in a, in a family business. Yeah, I just, it's just interesting because I've got I've got all kinds of questions regarding this. Like, oh my God, you work with your family. Like that <laughs> that must be a trip. And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I I um, we're actually like a. So the way that we operate, and it was in the beginning. I think I was my dad's second or third hire, uh, when he was when he was starting to buy homes creatively like this. Um, I always, I, I like grew up in it. So I don't know. I've, I've always got along with my parents and, um, I, I hang out, I hang out with uh, my mom and my dad and my, uh, sister and brother-in-law, like outside of work too. Like we, we, uh, we just never made it like a sibling rivalry kind of thing. Um, at the beginning when, when, um, Zach was starting out, um, there was a little bit of trying everything, like trying working with sellers. He would try work with buyers. And then we both naturally um, found our positions. And mine is mine is working with the buyers and fine tuning this buyer process to enable the buyers to be able to get their own loan. His was working with the sellers and actually replacing my dad and being the one that was going on the road and going to appointments and everything like that. So I think we naturally fell into the roles that we were meant to uh, without like stepping on each other's toes and saying, oh, that's mine. I'm going to do better kind of thing. And um, I don't know. I just never understood that whenever people say, oh, family business, like like fighting and what. I don't know. It's not just. Yeah, I, I don't know. Well, here's what I'll say from a family that it didn't work is from hearing that perspective, it sounds like it's really just like you mentioned, it just kind of fit, right? Um, Everything fell into place naturally. Unfortunately, I don't think that happens every time. Uh, I know that didn't happen for, for mine. So, but that's great to hear, right? Because that's the only way it's going to work is if everybody understands their roles, sticks to their roles, kind of stays in their lane, and you know things run smoothly um well that's an interesting thing that you just said like stick sticks to the lane so um i bet my sister took she was working with us like uh very closely and she was uh one she was working very closely with us when we were we were acquiring like anywhere five to ten properties a month and and just turning these properties she was very uh, closely like involved in what we were doing. She took a few years off to um, have kids. She They have a, a three-year-old and a five-year-old right now. So she took a few years off to have kids and uh, she came back and it's just, it's almost like we pick off right, right where we left off because um, when she came back, I don't know, this is kind of going off tra- topic, but I'm just, I want to say that she was like on this meeting and on that meeting and on this, like there was a lot of meetings. And she said to me, ah, Nick, why weren't you on this meeting? Why are you on that meeting? And I said, Kayla, I don't, 
have to be on every meeting. I don't, I don't have to be involved in everything that the company is doing. Like I know my specialty and where I'm most effective. So I want to like double down and really laser focus on that because that's what's going to, that's what's going to make the difference and be able to have our associates close more deals, not me being involved in every meeting. So that's just an example. Interesting. Okay. So, so, I mean, obviously, you know, goes without saying communication is really the, the, the key there and, and the most important part. Is she still involved? Like, is this a whole family affair? Or is it? Yeah. It's a, it's, yeah. Okay. She, yeah. She just came back and uh, we just, we just last week had our uh, Wicked Smart Summit and we hold two big events a year. That was, that was, um, that was one of them. And I think it was the biggest, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, and it, it was the best run event and the most successful. And she was like, no mistake, like she was actually like in charge of running like the whole event and, and coordinating with everyone. And it was great to have her back in the mix. And I said to her last week, I said, Kayla, this is like, this is awesome. I get to see you every day. Like I used to like six, seven years ago when we were working together closely. This is great. I love this. That's awesome. So it's your dad, you, brother-in-law and sister. Yeah. For like family. Yeah. Uh, family. And then we have, we have like tons of other people. Um, but. Um, oh, wow. Okay. So it's a, huge, yeah, it's company. not, it's not just us. Yeah. That's just, that's just the family. You did uh, mention the associates. Family. Yeah. That's just the family aspect. Like we have, we have all kinds of people helping and we wouldn't be where we are without um, all those, all those people helping. And um, I, I don't want to downplay that. It's not like I'm doing everything. My dad and I are doing everything ourselves. It's like, we have a lot of help. That's awesome. I love it. Well, Nick, this has been amazing. Uh, it's been fascinating to kind of learn about your process. Love hearing kind of the, uh, I don't know if obscure is the right word, but kind of those, yeah, a little bit kind of out there uh, real estate opportunities to, again, show people that, hey, listen, like, if you can think it, you can do it in real estate. And um, it, it's incredible. And obviously, you're helping people as well, which we always love to hear, especially on this show. We're, we're huge fans of that. So um, we'll go ahead and wind down here. We'll jump to the final five. Uh, first question, best advice you've gotten from a mentor? Ooh, best advice I got from a mentor. So I'm, I received, and this is, this is actually real estate related because when I was, um, back when I was a realtor back in 2009, I, I used to go out and visit my mentor out on the Cape and I would, I would spend the mornings with him and then have lunch with him. And I did that several times. And one of the things that he said to me on one of those visits really stuck with me. Um, his name is Danny Griffin. He he still coaches our uh, realtors today. Uh, the Realty Classroom, I believe, is his um, his brand and what he's trying to promote in his business. But he said something that really stuck with me and really rang true, and that's Nick. The because he wasn't the head coach at the time; it was like within a program. He said, "All of all of these people, like all these mentors, don't ever put anyone up on a pedestal um, and think that they have it all figured out." Because they, he was sharing with me, like at the time, well, this person's a mess. But you would never know that because behind the scenes, they have all the all these problems and things going on. So never put anyone on a pedestal, um, whether it's a mentor or anyone, because everyone's dealing, everyone's dealing with life and everyone's doing the best they can. So don't ever think for a minute that everyone, anyone's better than you. Uh, that was always something that really stuck, rang true with me and has really stuck with me just because um, I treat everyone how I, how I would want to be treated. And it's, it's something that's really uh, sustained me. And I've, I've carried that throughout my life is that everyone's dealing with something. So everyone, everyone has something going on behind the curtain. They're just showing you what they want you to see. Uh you're smiling, right. nodding your head. Do you, do you have a, uh... Oh, I absolutely 100% concur. Like, the, yeah. and, and I love that advice. It, it's so true. Right. And, and it kind of lends itself to almost that 
excuse me, battling that imposter syndrome, you know, like when you get into a room filled with people, you know, 10, 20, hundred million dollar net worth people. And you're like, oh my gosh, do I even belong here? And then, you know, you kind of put that perspective into it. And it's like, no, yes, these people have, you know, like it got put to me very well in the beginning with my podcast. I had some big name people on and they're like, I'm doing this because I was in your seat one day, you know, and you just remember that everybody started somewhere. And like you said, everybody has something going on and a really great perspective to have. Uh, what is about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? Uh, I can I can tell you for a fact that ever since my snowboarding accident, I have always, and maybe I didn't feel it in high school just because I was so young, but since I graduated and like entered the working field and got my real estate license and whatever I was doing, no matter how successful I was being, I've always had this voice in the back of my head that has always been telling me that you have to be sharing your story and helping others that are going through a trauma, life challenge, or anything of the sort, um, and helping them get through to the other side and thrive with the rest of their life. So I've always had that voice in the back of my head saying that. However, since I've been, I had someone approach me because I've been speaking at our at our events for years, uh, several years. Back in 2019, I had someone hand me hand me their card and said, if you're ever interested, her name was Sharon Spano. If you're ever interested in really fine tuning your story and crafting your message so it can help the most amount of people, I can introduce you to people. I can get you started. I was still going through a challenge with my voice at the time, so I wasn't ready. I always hung on to her card and Exactly two years ago, I reached out to her and I said, okay, I'm ready. So it was April of uh, 2021. I said, okay, I'm ready. What what do I do? She introduced me to her mentor, uh, Trisha Brooke. And I had a call with Trisha. She, I said, what do you recommend? She said, do the speaker salon. That was, I commuted to New York City for six weeks in a row. Um, that was the fall of 21. During the speaker salon, she pitched working with her one-on-one -on -one and what that would look like. And I just said, yes, I didn't know how I was going to get the funds, but I just said yes and figured it out. And a week later, I, um, I sent, I just moved forward with her and sent her the money. And um, I, since I've been, since I made that phone call to Sharon and said, yes, like I'm ready. Um, there's been no voice. I've had no voice in the back of my head. And that's that's evidence and proof to me that I'm following my purpose and I'm doing what I was put on this earth to do, which is help others that are going through trauma or life challenge or adversity get to the other side and thrive with the rest of their life. That's awesome. I absolutely love that so much. Uh, favorite non-real estate or investment related book? This is, this is an easy one. My favorite book of all time is uh, Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. <laughs> I think I've read it cover to cover uh, 10 times. And my uncle actually gave it to me. Uh, he's no longer here. He actually passed away a lung cancer back um, in 2009 at the age of 46. He gave that to me when I graduated high school. And I just, that book, I, I really wish I was back to like right after high school and I had the chance to read it for the first time just because I really enjoyed it. Wow. That's awesome. Uh, what's it called again? Zen. It's an old book. Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. Wow. Okay. Uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? I believe it doesn't have to be a, a like, um, like a super fish, like a, um, like, like, uh, something that's out of this world or something, but I believe I do have a superpower and that's, um, by focusing in the moment, being in the moment. And I experienced this when I spoke a couple of weeks ago at the brain injury association of Maryland, 
by being in the moment and focusing in the moment, uh, just trying to be all about it and totally in the moment, I'm really able to, um, what's going to happen when I'm having conversations with people, images and the words and answers just like come to my mind if I'm focusing in the moment. And I think there has been no other place that I have that except when I'm forced to focus in the moment, like right before a big talk, like a 60 minute talk uh, where I, I, I can't really worry. So I believe I have a superpower and that's to um, really anticipate what, what uh, people are going to say. And so I can best help them and lead them. I love that. That's awesome. Uh, last one. I know you have some uh, freebies and everything. Uh, to give away some some awesome value for everyone. So what's the best way for people to get a hold of you and learn more? Sure. So if on the real on the real estate end, Jonathan, if there's anything like about our conversation that really sparked an interest in how we buy and sell creatively uh, without using our cash or credit, they can go to our website, which is wickedsmartinc.com. And if they scroll down a bit, they can get registered for the free master's class. And I'm not, we change it um, like frequently and we experiment and change, but it's, I don't know, anywhere 20 to 40 minutes. And by the end, it's not a good fit for everyone, how we buy and sell. However, by the end, they'll know if it's a good fit for them and they'll be able to take the next step. Um, then I know we touched on it briefly when I was telling my story, but uh, the, if you're interested in learning more about the step system. So, uh, I, I, I know I said it's an acronym support, trust, energy, and persistence. Um, however, I invite anyone to go to my website, nickprefontaine.com forward slash step to download the step system for free today. So if they're, um, dealing, whatever they're dealing with, doesn't matter what they're dealing with. Um, they're going to be able to learn all about support, trust, energy, and persistence because it, it, go, it goes deep. Um, and it's going to help them lead them through to the other side and be able to thrive with the rest of their life. That's awesome. I love it. We will link all of that in the show notes. I happen to have one of the books that Nick co-authored as well. Um, which Nick. I didn't, I didn't even know. I mean, like, like we said at the beginning, I just want to treat this organically. I don't even think I told, I told your listeners, but uh, we can give them a, um, a way to get that, that book for free, uh, new rules of real estate investing. So I'm a co-author on that book and um, we'd love to get it hundred percent free to your listeners. Uh, the way they access that is wickedsmartbooks.com. Uh, forward slash investor relations. And um, when when I say free, it's 100% free. So we even pay the shipping and handling. I know a lot of people when you say free and you opt in, it says, oh, I actually you owe us $20 for shipping and handling. Like we pay everything. So um, if they're interested in getting a free copy of that, again, I'll give it it's wickedsmartbooks.com forward slash investor relations. Awesome. We will link all of that in the show notes, make it super easy. Nick, thank you so much for your time. This is absolutely incredible. I, I had a bunch of fun. You're so welcome. And thank you for having me, Jonathan. Absolutely. Thank you again for tuning in. Who do you know that wants more cash flow? Share this episode with them so you can grow your cash flow together. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you're subscribed on your platform of choice so you never miss a new episode. Go to KataniCapitalGroup.com to learn more.